Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're very excited to have with us Thomas Udison, who's the Chief Procurement Officer at uh, Bayer and co-founder of the Sustainable Procurement Pre Pledge. Thomas, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and talking with us today. Thank you. And thanks for everybody who is listening in, even if you are forced to do it. But thanks for <laughs> spending time listening to this topic. It's important. So please pay attention. Uh, so, Thomas, we're going to kind of I'm going to start with, I think, the most difficult question that uh, I ask. Uh, if you think about the word sustainability or business sustainability, uh, how do you define business sustainability? OK, so I think the, a lot of the uh, uh, sort of grounding of, of what is sustainability is defined by the United Nations principles, Grohal and Brundtland, you know, when she talked about that, what is it, 10, 15 years ago, it is living within the planet by, uh, planetary boundaries of today without sacrificing the uh, prospects for future generations as well. So I think that, you know, is, is the macro level of, of definition. Trying to bring that into companies, um, I think it, it means that you are also making sure that your practices are operating within the both environmental uh, responsibilities and boundaries that you have to operate on, the social uh, dimensions, as well as the uh, economic. So a lot of people would typically say it's about the people, planet, and profit. And, and I would say when, when I look at procurement, um, role in sustainable supply chains, how do you do that uh, for a business, and um, that's what it is, it's the environmental, it's the social, and the um, economic. And what, what you have historically seen is that um, the, the, the profitability, the uh, economic, has to some extent been disconnected from the both uh, sustainability dimensions linked with environment and social. And, you would have seen that these two uh, bubbles of priorities and activities were historically quite far apart. What, what we see now, and it has certainly been a, a clear trend in the last 10, 15 years, is that these two bubbles are thankfully coming together. You have uh, certain companies who are looking at it maybe a little bit defensively, and they sort of gradually touch each other. But you have seen other companies who are saying that, you know, in fact, our whole purpose, our company's mission is linked with sustainable principles. And with that, there is an increasing overlap. And that continuum is, is what we see across the multitude of uh, organizations in the world. Well, oh, perfect. I, I love this kind of analogy of the overlap of the bubbles. And so let's think kind of, you know, I, I, I love continuum kind of where maybe they're touching, but they're overlap. Let's say they overlap 25%. And if we can kind of focus on what that 25%, what would that mean when we're talking about sustainable business practices, uh, specifically from procurement, of that 25% that overlap, where we can see the benefit on both yeah. uh, ends? I would say if you are at the 25%, you are probably just meeting the increasing regulatory expectations uh, that are happening. And, and you see that happening across the world. You know, EU is doing that in the US also. You hear that there are increasing expectations around good corporate business. Um, and with that, the 25, what would you typically be doing? You would make sure that your supply chains are free of, uh, let's say, human rights abuses. You would see that the supply chain has an, a large degree of uh, control when it comes to uh, environmental uh, practices in the, in the supply chain. And you would maybe see the first sort of migration towards a, a CO2 reduction a glide path where companies would move some of their fossil-based uh, consumption dependency towards renewables. Um, so with the 25%, that, that's really what you're looking at in the US in particular, um, looking at things um, like diversity and inclusion, um, you know, to which extent are you using your economic power for good to also minimize inequality that you see across society? So, Supplier diversity would, would fit into to that uh, domain. So with 25%, it's quite traditional. I dare to say it's a bit defensive, but it's not looking at how can sustainability become a engine for you know, growth and how you position your company. For that, you need to move a little bit more. So, so let's talk about that, maybe 50 or 60, 5% 5, 5 overlap. So if we were trying to... Uh, get a, a sustainable competitive advantage or a competitive advantage to sustainability, uh, an engine for growth, like you said, what are some of the things that kind of start to, how do we recognize some of the values or how do you, what is your experience 
kind of in where you yeah. recognize some of the value add beyond re regulatory. Yeah, I think once you get to that 50 plus, it, it starts getting really interesting, right? And, and typically you would call them impact generators. So it's impact also in the society where, where you operate. And, and a lot of it is linked with uh, new you know, modalities of how do you do your business? Um, how do you convert your uh, dependency on fossil fuel towards uh, new, maybe bio-based uh, options? And how do you create a value proposition towards your customers, clients uh, that is also helping them reduce their uh, impact, the CO2 targets, etc. And, and that's really where it gets into science, when it gets into innovation, when it comes to looking at different ways of delivering your product, your value towards the um, stakeholders, your, your client base, whatever that, whatever that may be. So for example, if you are a chemical company and you have all your synthesis based on old technology, um, you know, you would find a new way of synthesizing with, you know, 40% uh, less energy using 50% of bio-based materials. And with that, you can tangibly show that you are reducing your CO2 and your environmental impact. That again, when you sell that to a customer like me, I can also use that to make sure that my scope three emission targets, as well as my value towards my customers, reflects that I'm increasing the portion of um, sustainable materials in my product portfolio. So a lot around you know, using innovation, different modalities of, of getting your value to the consumers. So I think this is a perfect kind of segment to really fit, uh, understand a little bit more. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, Bayer and what you specifically do on a you know on a daily daily basis within within the organization? Okay, so so my job is you know as a CPO uh, that that uh, I run a, a global organization. I have teams that are sitting in all corners of the world, and we manage a a humongous engine of uh, of transactions of uh, of commercial value um, for the organization. So that means uh, we are having around 60,000 suppliers. We have 300 manufacturing sites. We have 1,000 you know, plus people um, and we negotiate all the deals. So, so the um, value that we are transacting is 24 billion, which is 2 billion a month. It's a, it's a half a billion per week. So you know, my team negotiates 100 million US per, per day. And that's in millions and millions and of, of transactions. Um, so of course, we make sure that we, we have the right partners, that we have access to innovation, that we have resilience in our supply chain, that we don't deal with companies who have bad practices, and that we also go on a roadmap of um, progress with our, with our supply base. And we, we monitor that across a whole range of, uh, of metrics, some of more traditional economic, but a lot of them around uh, reliability, access to innovation, um, but also very increasingly so around their sustainability uh, profile. And you know what are they doing that helps us reduce our footprint? So I think we'll go back to uh, one of your earlier comments. You started talking about scope three uh, impact and the impact yeah. that these suppliers can have on Bayer. Uh, do, do you mind telling us a little bit more about kind of how you look at measure your scope one and scope two uh, emissions yeah. and then how the, kind of the suppliers can have an impact with scope three? Yeah, I think that whole idea around scope one, two and three is, is uh, born to a great extent out of the science-based target initiative, SBTI, which is a multilateral effort, uh, including uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project. It's got WWF as a founding member. It's got the World Resource Institute. So really a, a whole bunch of, of experts who said, how are we gonna address the topic specifically for the SPTI around uh, sort of the roadmap to zero, net zero carbon emissions. And um, most of those targets are linked with the Paris Climate Agreement where um, most nations now also including uh, the states um, has said, you know, we need to make sure that we stay within the one and a half degrees increase of, of uh, temperature for the for the for the globe and to do that um, companies are committing to a reduction um, in their co2 emissions and they are being looked at according to scope one which is really your direct um, operations so what is it that you are doing in your own factories a big lever here is of course energy 
So for example, we have signed up for the one and a half degree scenario, which means that by 2030, we will reduce our scope one and two by 42%, not by buying certificates, 42%. That means, of course, that we need to have all our energy renewables. So we are now flipping all our renewable, our energy consumption to renewables. It means that um, all the processes that you're having somehow needs to deliver the same product but in a more energy efficient way. So that's what is in scope one, your direct operations. Then you get to scope two, you look at the sort of indirect internal, it's your, it's your air travel, it's your commuting of your people when they drive to the office, it's the um, logistics that you have within your network. You know, you, you start also looking at scope two as a means to reduce. And, and likewise here, we are having a whole bunch of uh, initiatives, many small initiatives, continuous improvement that of course over the next eight, 10 years will sort of aggregate towards that ambitious target. But that's not where the real CO2 sits. The real CO2 for any organization sits in scope three and that's where procurement uh, gets into the game. This is where all the scope three is everything that you source. So uh, all your raw materials, all your logistics providers, all your data centers, all your, you know, uh, yeah, that, that's really where, where a lot of the, uh, the real challenges is. For Bayer specifically, it's around 80% of the CO2 comes through scope three. So it becomes really a critical uh, for procurement when you're then dealing with your suppliers, that they are part of your solution, because there's no way you can reduce 42% unless you know, the suppliers are doing exactly the same. And, and that's the type of conversations that are taking place nowadays, where, for example, uh, we have made it very clear to our suppliers, if you want to be uh, preferential, and if you, if you want to travel business class, you have access to great business opportunities, innovation briefs, etc. We expect you to be committed to this roadmap. You have to be green, which means Ecovadi score 45, but I need to see that you are reducing the, the CO2 emissions. Um, and if you don't, you know, we may still be able to do some business with you, but I will bump you down to economy class. So, you know, you will not have the same um, preferential treatment. And if you don't have any uh, intentions to improve, maybe next time the plane takes off, you know, you're not on the plane. I will have found somebody who is more fun to travel with. And that messaging is now going into the supply chain. With that, they're changing practices. And with that, you know, the whole uh, sort of world supply chains are changing. And, and just a little fun fact, um, there is the world trade around business to business and product as services is around 8.7 trillion. So it, it is significant. And managing this whole network there's approximately around 1 million procurement professionals in you know all these supply chains from the mines and the fisheries and palm oil towards apple and you know your your little devices and that's you know those are the people who can transform the the economy and that's exactly what uh, what we are doing um, in companies by requesting that our suppliers are changing their practices of course, for them to be successful, they need to ask their suppliers to do exactly the same. Perfect. I really kind of appreciate the examples you had and kind of walking through this. I think the airplane one is perfect, but I'd like to kind of, you know, we typically think about sustainability or if I was to ask a layman, a procurement doesn't come to the forefront or I don't think that most people don't think that uh, procurement has such a large impact. You know, you mentioned 80% uh, for a Bayer and it's probably, you know, I'd agree with you, probably more than 50% at most organizations. So how did it come for Bayer where they saw the light or they saw the impact of bringing the suppliers and the supply chain folks on board and kind of how you leverage that through procurement? I mean, what was yeah. this, the, the Kindle that started this? Well, I think a, a, a lot of what you described is true. I think most people out there have no idea how sexy procurement is. I mean, this is where the decisions are made. And, you know, if you're studying, you got to come to this. We make the decisions. So we don't necessarily broadcast it that uh, vividly because, you know, that's okay. Other we have marketing teams and that's what they do. But that's, that's, that's the reality. And, and most of the industries who, who have gotten that over the last 10, 15 years are the FMCGs. It's the electronics where there's a huge demand for at both the cost focus, but also innovation focus. And, and those type of industries 
have severely matured their procurement practices. And, and now, of course, this whole sustainability agenda is becoming uh, mainstream for a lot of procurement organizations. And, and many companies are starting to realize that maybe this is a bit of a, a jewel that, uh, that needs to be polished and, and that we need to make sure that our procurement organization is equipped, has the right talent, has the right technology to also uh, operate within this new mandate, which is, uh, which is being created. Um, so, so I think in, in certain industries, it's pretty obvious um, that uh, you know, it's, if, if you wanna have access to innovation, you, you need to have a organization that is well connected with the outside world. And, and that's what procurement is. We are sitting at this cross between the internal and the external world. Um, so if innovation, if cost, if partnerships, important you gotta build capabilities in, in this uh, space and the, the way that the world is moving it becomes more ecosystems of collaborative companies that's where we are all going and the old model that you know you 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 innovate everything yourself you manufacture everything yourself and you you know even send it to the customers in your own trucks that model is is broken and it, it doesn't really work so as the, the world economic model has transitioned, the role of procurement has also changed and with that uh, increased. You know, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier as you, you know, let's go back to this overlap where there's maybe 75% uh, overlap between, you know, sustainability practices and financial practices. And, and you talked about seeing the financial benefit or seeing the benefit of suppliers as you engage them in sustainability. You talked about them being more innovative or... Uh, uh, more reactive. How do you see that play out? I mean, if, if we were, um, you know, selecting two suppliers, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm not going to take you the next time we go on a plane. You're not going to, I'm going to give preference to somebody else, but is there a value of giving preference to somebody who's more sustainable? I mean, how do you see that play out in procurement? Yeah. The, the, so, so one thing is, of course, what is such a partner able to do around future innovation? Is it a partner that is investing into new technologies and with that comes with solutions that are attractive for us? Or is it a me too that just runs the asset at its uh, sort of uh, re renewable uh, level? Um, that, that's one big sort of influencing factor. The other one is, of course, now with, with CO2, um, that that becomes, a, in a way, a currency. Because with companies signing up for reduction targets for, for CO2, that means you know, I, I have a ceiling. There's only so much CO2 that I can spend per year. And um, if I fail to do that, you know, it's gonna have consequences which I can monetize, I can put a value behind that. So with that, carbon starts to have a, a price, a value. And many organizations are introducing Sort of internal um, uh, carbon metrics, um, a carbon price, which is influencing what uh, investments you make, um, and also where do you then ultimately put your your money? Because if you have that scenario that supplier A is a great price but has a miserable CO2 footprint, and supplier B has a increased price, but an amazing CO2 footprint. Once you start adding those together in a sort of social total cost of sustainable, uh, then you can start to make different decisions. And that mathematical um, algorithmic uh, thinking is being introduced now also in, in organizations linked with sustainability. So Carbon is, of course, just one externality that um, you know you can start to put a price tag on. But there are other externalities as well. And as you know, we we move towards 2030, where the United Nations SDGs have to be delivered. Those externalities will have price tags, and and we can start to model and with that make better decisions. So I, I love this perfect opportunity to bring in SDGs in. Uh, for better or worse, a lot of us are really worried about uh, global warming, obviously, and the uh, CO2 emissions that's driving that and how can we drive down the CO2 emissions to bring kind of the, the, the warming down. Yeah. But you mentioned other externalities and the SDGs provide a, a good few of them, you know, energy consumption, waste generation, impact on society, water consumption in water stressed areas. Uh, are you folks starting to bring 
we're trying to figure out what prices can be associated with those externalities as you bring them in. I mean, I, I love the example you did on CO2. Yeah, and, and of course, the different external, externalities has a different impact in different industries. So if, if you are in the water industry, then of course, you would have very mature practices around, you know, what are, is the impact of where do you source your water? What does it do on the groundwater? If if you do it the wrong way, it may carry a whole bunch of, of costs, which are linked with, you know, your poor practices, and that has maybe a certain consequences. And you can put values behind those. Likewise, if you are in the uh, cement industry, you know, your mining operation, or so. I, I think um, if I look at, at, at Bayer, for example, um, you know, what is it that that is important for us? Is of course. Um, a lot of the operations into our chemical manufacturing. It's the data centers. It's the um, impact on um, on clinical trials when we have human trials that, that needs to be uh, also orchestrated for uh, accelerating new drugs to towards uh, populations. It's working with with growers, smallholder farmers who are helping us create uh, seeds. Um, and you know, how do we make sure that? That their children are getting access to uh, to education rather than you know being on on the farm. So each part of the supply chain has a unique set of uh, externalities, and and you know I think we don't have as a world we don't have all the answers right now, but I think you know we need to start looking at those, and we all need to start recognizing that they have to be modeled into your decision making. And most likely, it, that requires a mathematical constant, which typically is linked with an economic value. Perfect. I think that's a, a wonderful kind of transition. Well, we're, we don't have a commercial break, so let's kind of take a, a short two-minute break to get to know a, a little bit more about you. And uh, I'm going to kind of ask you some personal questions. I hope you don't mind. We'll start with kind of our uh, first one. What is the lowest grade that you got in a college or university? Oh, uh, I was miserable in French, and and uh, I don't even think I passed. I, I don't even think I showed up. So <laughs> it's got what I, I can't remember. It's it's a few years back, but I think it's it's somehow linked with French. I'm sure. Perfect. Uh, and what is the best dessert you've ever had, and where, or if it's something you bought on the shelf or a specific place you've been to? Oh, best dessert. Um, my 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 son has a um, taste for sort of, uh, what are they called, lemon, a lemon tart, you know, where it's, it's lemon and it's, it's got sugar in it and it's, it's sort of jelly-ish. And, and he has somehow from, I guess, colluded with his mother. And they have figured out how to make uh, these lemon tarts and they are damn good, I have to say. So I would say that's probably the best one. And, and the fact that it's made by my son also makes it uh, even, you know, homemade, uh, yeah, that's a perfect homemade. answer. Yeah. Our, our last question on this is, what is one app on your phone that you cannot absolutely live without? So I'm a bit active on LinkedIn, I have to say, but it, it's linked, of course, with my, my day job, but it's also linked with my sort of hobby where we have uh, launched the Sustainable Procurement Pledge, um, where it is a, a community that we are trying to activate. Those one million procurement practitioners I talked about, we are trying to uh, find a way of uh, networking all of those and making uh, knowledge available to them for free. So in a way, democratizing uh, sustainable procurement knowledge. And as that uh, nonprofit grassroots thing is growing, it's, it's quite nice to see that the world is responding very favorably towards this uh, topic. Can you tell us a little bit more about the procurement pledge and how you know other uh, procurement professionals can get involved or people who are looking to get into the field can get a little bit more involved on that? Yeah, so, so the whole thing was kicked off and, and inspired by the climate strike uh, 19. So I think the climate strike is, is always in September and, and that was really the trigger point. You know, kids and adults from all walks of life went to the street and reminded us saying, you know, how, how can we be so silly and, and not really take our responsibility of preserving resources for the next generation that seriously? So I thought, we, that's a, that's a good point. And I made a LinkedIn post. That um, was, uh, let's say, responded with an with a overwhelmingly keen interest from academics, uh, from procurement practitioners, some of the uh, multipliers in, in the 
as a media um, who then said yes let's let's do something and and I, I, I called my, uh, my, my partner in crime, Bertrand uh, Concouré, who is the CPO at Henkel, so a, a company down the street. We, we sort of born that uh, the idea of having a pledge for procurement practitioners was, was then born. And then we launched it, not really knowing maybe exactly what, what would happen. And, and with that, the world responded very favorably. Um, we created a website, www.spp.earth. I mean, there you can see a lot. Um, and, um, and we have so far attracted 3,800 uh, ambassadors from 142 countries. So it's literally everywhere in the world that people say, um, you know, we want to find a way of, uh, of accelerating the topic of sustainable procurement. And we are prepared to listen and to also offer knowledge. Um, and of course, that is an enormous knowledge center, which we are, we are trying to create. Um, and that's really where we are. So we are not, we're just registering a, a, a nonprofit here. We're going to hopefully find some funders. We will hopefully be able to hire a few people. And then we will have chapters, you know, all around the world, a bit similar to the, you know, the rotary type of thing where, where every industry, country, village has a SPP uh, a chapter. So big plans, um, but we have with 3,800, we are good on the way, but since there's a million to reach, we are not uh, in goal yet. Perfect, and I'd strongly recommend uh, the, the organization and the website. There's a lot of information available for sust sustainability uh, professionals and procurement professionals as they try and integrate sustainability in their practices. Kind of shifting on that, if, if we push on that a little bit. So if you think about, uh, Let's leave kind of maybe not Bayer, you're not your organization, but if I'm an outsider looking at a different organization, how can I better understand how they're doing, how they're performing in sustainability, right? It, yeah. Are they doing good, medium, poor? As an outsider, what are some metrics or some things I can look at? Yeah, I mean, there's thankfully a lot happening uh, also in the, in the tech space. Uh, lots of startups who are, who are now helping to bring transparency into company practices, um, and, and many of them are using entirely externally available data where you look at you know, company profiles, you, you look at media, press reports, uh, lawsuits, etc. You know, so, so you, can, you can actually figure out quite a lot uh, about a company. Um, and they are now um, also being used by all procurement organizations, pretty much who has a program in place. So, so that's uh, sort of secondary uh, online data that is available. And that's almost the minimum uh, knowledge that you can get. Then you can bump on the next level and, and you can do that with uh, real data-based assessments. And there are a few vendors. We are using Ecovadis, which is a methodology where the suppliers are then being asked really to pre-populate lots of, of questions uh, with evidence that uh, they say we have a uh, policy around human rights abuses. Well, you know, show us the documentation. We have practices linked with um, working hours, you know, show us all that. And then that is being cross-referenced with uh, external data. And that will give you a, a score and that will give you a, a pretty good idea of where they okay, where they may be good and where do they need to, to focus. That's the next level. And then, you know, based on that, you may find that there are certain risk indicators that would suggest that you need an online uh, on-site audit. And that's really where you, you send people in, you know, either announced or unannounced um, to, to go through interview um, people on the, on the, uh, on the sites, uh, HR, leadership, talk to people on the lines to understand is, you know, is there a problem here or do we actually have some, um, some uh, acceptable practices? And, and that would be the, the third sort of level. If then you find things, and, and it's always with a magnifying glass, the, the closer you look, you know, the more you find, um, that would typically then be, be, become part of how you manage the, uh, the supplier. You've got the regular reviews, there are corrective actions. Um, and you know you will ask for evidence that these corrective actions are addressed, closed, and that you are you are moving on. And then you know after a period you will come back and check you know did they do that. So that that's practically how you manage your your portfolio. And of course with that you find 
all of the companies who have a general commitment to, to improve and do things. And you will find out who is just, you know, not planning to do anything about it. And those are the ones that you would typically bump out on your way as you segment your suppliers. So, I mean, kind of pushing on this, really two questions come out of this is, uh, the first, you know, you kind of talked about uh, the magnifying glass. I, I love that analogy. You know, as soon as you bring it, you try to start seeing more. The closer you look, the more likely you're going to find problems. That's just a, a reality. Yeah. So uh, how do you deal with the fact that, you know, if we talk to more senior management, we say, oh, the more like, you know, if we audit or we look at our suppliers, there's a likelihood we're going to find some problems. Uh, how do you communicate that it's still good to do these audits because even though we might find identify issues, what's the value of, you know, your the procurement or, organization yeah. identifying the, the, the issue? Well, you know, in a way it, it's common sense. And, and I work for a company that gets this and I, I don't have to debate with my leaders whether I should do that. You know, the, the consequences of not doing it are much worse, right? So in, in, in that scenario, we are very clear. If there is smoke, you know, we have to assume there may be a fire and we are gonna send the uh, troops to, to check that out. That's a underlying philosophy and it, it's really not uh, questioned. Um, and then, of course, once you, you have those uh, ideas uh, of, of what is going on, the vast majority of organizations will respond positive and, and will also say, I'm prepared to do that. Maybe not always out of good heart and intention, but because they understand if I'm not going to do it, you know, this customer is going to you know, leave and, and they may have different motivations. But typically the response is I will move and I will address your concern. Um, and that, that's good. And then, of course, we, we can see who is really window dressing and who is generally behind that. And the window dressers, again, we get rid of as quickly as we can. So I'm going to go back to something you talked about earlier, where you talked about some organizations are good about showcasing maybe what they're doing in sustainability. So uh, I'm a, at heart a true operations and supply chain person. And so I love to kind of bring supply chain to the forefront. I really like how you talked about procurement and the impact procurement has on the organization. You're doing so much with your supply base and working very closely and truly trying to get the, sustain, uh, the, the supply base to be sustainable because of the impact it has, but just because it's also the right thing to do in the, in the, in the business financial impacts. How do you communicate that to your customer base? How do you communicate? You said you have people, you know, senior leadership sees the light and buys it. So that's perfect. But how do we communicate that to out, people outside the organization? Yeah, again, it, it depends a bit on, on where you are in the value chain, right? Uh, if you are in business to business, um, often we see that with uh, some of these industry initiatives we are, we are having together for sustainability. You know, we, we make sure that our results are also published to our customers because with that, they can also see that this is a company that is serious about that. And that is within the uh, expectations that they may have and what they need to also get on. So, I think in business to business, your, your scores, your equivalents, your KPI progression, you know, is a source of, um, it's a source of uh, credibility. Of course, if, if you're also in, in that value chain that you can convert from, let's say, uh, a fossil fuel dependent, you know, only virgin material towards recycle, or you can go from fossil based to renewables and you have innovation on the back of that, you know, that's very, very attractive. And, and in a business to business setting, you know, the procurement person that's buying would be very, very favorable towards, uh, towards that. Now, when you get to business to consumer, it's of course slightly different. It's, it's you and I, you know, do we change our behavior? Are we prepared to also uh, make choices and preferences based on the uh, sustainability profile of our supplier, whether it's a big uh, FMCG, you know, Fair trade, does that have anything, the, the FSC certified on the, on the cardboard? Does that influence our decision? I think here we all have maybe slight different um, practices, but that, that's where we, you know, with our own decision can create demand that ultimately changes the whole supply chain. So we actually have a huge responsibility as an individual to, to do that. So that, that's, that's what I think we, we do. So business to business, it's through certification, credible KPI data. But towards the consumer, it's it's a making it available and um, you're hoping that the consumer gets it. 
So, you know, on the last point on this, thinking about the personal social responsibility, the impact that I have as an individual on sustainability and this B2C. So as a consumer, what are some things that I can do to help make sure I'm thinking about the right things when I think about a, if a company's acting sustainability and actually changing my price, or what can I change to truly have an impact? Yeah, I think first of all, of course, you need to know what you're talking about. So, so I think uh, there is a lot of uh, you know misinformation out there. There's a lot of information. Some is good, some is not. Lots of opinions. I think it, it's important to educate yourself and, and get to to the facts of, of what is really favorable towards a uh, uh, sustainable future and and what is not and 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 try to educate yourself. I think through that education you will also be more capable of making the right decision. But it will necessitate a preparedness to make personal choices that may be you know not as convenient. So you know I, I have a 100% electric uh, car here as well. I mean just you know visiting my family far away is uh, you know it changes my planning and takes longer time. But, you know, I have chosen to do that because I fundamentally believe that is a step in the right direction. It helps technology advance so that the real solution around uh, the low carbon mobility will be found. But, you know, that preparedness to, to make a, a personal sacrifice for what you believe in, that's, of course, something we all need to do. And there are many who do not fast fashion, you know, on and on and on, where uh, we just see really horrible behavior uh, every day happening in front of our eyes. And there you have to, you know, make you up your mind and, and stand up. So on this now, hopefully people have heard the value and see the value of sustainability. So how do you encourage people to move into the field of sustainability? So maybe somebody who is you know, in their early 20s, just starting off their business career, how yeah. do they start integrating business sustainability and kind of moving towards that? Okay, so, you know, totally honest, I'm not so concerned about you or anybody who is listening here, because I think actually you get it. I, I think the, the, the generation that is coming into the workforce um, really is very, very well uh, educated about uh, this uh, has the the topic front of mind and, and I think the evidence is that um, you know many of these exit surveys from universities suggest that 70 percent you know would never want to work for a company that doesn't have a responsible uh, practice that uh, you know is only profit maximizing so I think actually you and the academic world is doing a great job in in preparing the uh, the workforce for that so the more in me, and, and there, you know, there are many things, whether it's at the marketing, whether it is on the supply chain, whether it's in the uh, sustainability, which is also really getting into how do you convert scope one and two. I mean, there's a lot of technical process knowledge that is required to, to deliver this. I think almost any job will have a aspect of sustainability you know, as we move forward. So I think you can have you can live your passion in, in many many ways um, i think for many organizations the real challenge is actually the current workforce right who has who has uh, you know been educated uh, have grown in their roles in, in different times with different um, ideas of what uh, right looks like um, and, and I think here, that's also one of the reasons why with the pledge, we are really trying to, to educate the existing workforce, the 1 million people, and, and give them the necessary information, and make sure that some of these dogmas that, that we have are being challenged and that your dogmas are being replaced with, with real sort of practical uh, experiences. Many people are afraid of changing how uh, they're supposed to do things. This has made them successful for 20, 30 years. Now you're asking me to change. You know, what does that mean? I don't know. So you can also build the courage and, and make sure that, that leadership provides the framework to, to do this. So that's, that's where, where the immediate challenge is to how do we re-educate 1 million people, you know, plus, 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 because it's their whole organization to do the right thing. Let's talk about this one million people and the you know existing dogmas they're in, and maybe their senior leadership doesn't see the light. So maybe I'm I'm somebody in procurement or somebody in operations, and I see the light. I understand the 
positive impact and I, I want to change, but maybe senior, like you said, you don't have senior leadership that get it. What are some things that I can do within my organization so we truly extract some business value to tell them, you know, the old way of doing things just doesn't work anymore. We need to do it the right way. Here's what we're leaving on the table. Here's what our competitors are going to, you know, yeah. out innovate us, outsmart us. What are some things I can do? Those one million that, people I've worked on. That's exactly what you're, what you're saying, you know, educate yourself. Try to make sure you understand what are you doing relative to what is possible versus your competitors. Make sure that that uh, sort of total cost of ownership with the externalities that are relevant for your, your role itself, that they're being reflected in your recommendations and your, and your decisions. Make sure you're strong enough to argue for those business cases when people say, you know, I don't get it. Where do you uh, get that from? Because I, I fundamentally believe that most people will get it if we are capable of having the right conversation. And that is building the vocabulary that is more inclusive and more sustainable. And with that, you will find that people you think are, you know, not necessarily behind this actually get it because it's it's a long-term game. Um, it's, of course, requiring that you park some of this short-termism that is all about the next quarter and you are capable of looking at what does this look like in three, five, 10, you know, 50 years. And, and with that capability, you are more likely to be successful in convincing leaders. Now, you will find people who are hopelessly impossible uh, on, your, on your way and and there you need to, to find a way, you know, can you, can you work around those? Uh, is there a way of, of still getting stuff done that you are comfortable with, also with your own ethics? Or is this a, you know, have you reached the end of the, uh, end of the line here? And, and I am a very strong uh, advocate that if you happen to have a boss or you work for a company that doesn't get it and who is not prepared to allow you to do what you have to do, you know, run like mad, you know, don't waste your time on you know hopeless organizations like that because i'm convinced that if that's really genuinely their attitude it's also not where you want to put your bet those companies will wither to insignificance they have to you know and the professional buyers like you know me and my one million friends we are pretty determined to get rid of these companies because they are not helpful and it, it is, uh, you know, against everything we, we believe in and, and we will go after them. So if, if you're a great talent and you stay with them, you're making, you know, my job more difficult. So get out and get a good job. Perfect. Wonderful answer. I'll leave the last word with you. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us that we didn't cover or any parting thoughts? you want no, to I, I'm super happy that you're, you're doing this. And, and I, I, I really value these type of, of interactions. I, I'm so convinced that, that uh, you know, we need to collaborate across industry with academia. You know, the next talent is coming out. This is also, quite frankly, super exciting for you know, people like me. It's, it's, it's nice to, to see the can-do attitude, the uh, ideation that comes out of the, the next generation. And you know, having uh, amazing, uh, you know, professors and educators like yourself who is, who is making that bridge building is, is really fantastic. So, you know, make sure you, you, you know, don't compromise your, your ethics. Uh, make sure you figure out how cool supply chain and procurement actually is. If, if uh, it's only Amir who is saying it, but this is where, you know, the, the world business is happening. If, if you don't want to be just an administrator that knows a little narrow part of the value chain but you want to see the big picture you've got to, you've got to work with people like um, like us wonderful thank you very much i'm just going to leave it at that operations and supply chain probably the best you can do thank you very much for your time we thank know you're very busy we appreciate you taking time and thank you thank for listening you. everybody